Hello and welcome. I'm Chris Cowdley. On behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome and thank you for joining us for today's educational activity titled Streamlining the Journey to a Cure, Optimizing the Hepatitis C Virus Care Cascade. Today's activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. Today's CME CE activity is also eligible for ABIM mock points. So make sure you engage in today's event and provide your feedback. Once you complete today's program, be sure to provide your ABIM ID and date of birth on the evaluation so we can submit your credit to ABIM. As I mentioned, I'm Dr. Chris Cowdley. I'm director of the Liver Institute Northwest and clinical professor at the Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine at Washington State University in Spokane, Washington. Let me introduce our faculty joining me today. First, let me welcome Dr. Scott Howell from the AIDS Healthcare Foundation in Los Angeles, California. Welcome, Scott. Good afternoon. Also, let me introduce Dr. Anthony Martinez. Dr. Martinez is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Jacobs School of Medicine at the University of Buffalo and the Medical Director of Hepatology at Erie County Medical Center in Buffalo, New York. This started with one of the many reasons in our practices that this discussion is important, the patient. Let me share a story of a patient with HCV that truly impacted my practice. Um, I saw a patient that was recently um, <clears throat> turned down for being treated for HCV because of a history of injection drug use. And this was extremely stressful, the patient was distraught, and knowing that injection drug use or being on a substitution program was not an exclusion criteria for treatment made this patient's life seem optimistic and full of joy. Um, and I'm sure that uh, Tony may have similar uh, anecdotes as will Scott. Scott, so um, eliminating HCV is obviously very important. Um, Let's start talking about the World Health Organization's plan for eliminating HCV by 2030. Uh, like all goals, it is a good one, but how do we get there, particularly since we're seeing this dramatic increase in persons who inject drugs and associated with that, a very high increase in hepatitis C incidence? Chris, thank you. You know, this is a phenomenal way to, to start off, uh, you know, a series of lectures uh, regarding uh, HCV. And when you look at this um, uh, article from, uh, from JAMA Network, and you can see what we're looking at, we're actually discussing you know, the elimination of HCV by 2030. I remember my first patient you know, two decades ago that we were starting treatment on, and now only within 20 years or so, we're talking about the elimination of HCV. And this is a study that was in Canada, and we're talking about eliminating it within 2030. And this is a Markov model that was from Canada. And so what they did is they came up with, you know, five different scenarios of how to treat um, with DAAs. And within that, there's a very aggressive model down to one that has a rapid decrease. And then somewhere in the middle, you can see where how many people you need to treat in a given year uh, to make that Markov model so that you can then have elimination of HCV within 2030. And so you have a very aggressive, aggressive, gradual decrease, an optimistic um, model and a rapid decrease. And the optimistic model states in Canada, if they treat somewhere in the range of about 10,200 uh, persons per year, that that would be a great trajectory in order to eliminate HCV in 2030 within Canada. So Scott, uh these steps are important and the measures are clearly necessary. You've laid out several different scenarios. What are the most promising scenarios from your perspective? When you look at the, the modeling within the Markov models, um, you can see that there's not only, you know, if you look at the optimistic uh, model, that is uh, 10,200, you know, members that are treated in, in a given year, and then going up to that you know, aggressive model from 14,000 down to 10,000, you can see, you know, within that modeling that you can get within that 2030 elimination. But one of the greatest things about this modeling that they did was some of the ancillary, you know, uh, benefits to, to treating, you know, with DAAs in such an aggressive and optimistic manner. 
And when you look at that, you can see the, the decrease in, you know, the amount of viremia, viremia that's there, you know, the decrease in liver mortality, you know, the decrease in decompensated cirrhosis, and also decrease in HCC, about a hepatocellular carcinoma. And so when you look at this, then you can see that the, the morbidity that's associated with hepatitis C and treating in this optimistic and then that aggressive manner that you can you know, eliminate the virus even maybe two years earlier, you, know, you get such ancillary benefits to the entire health system and the decrease in morbidity and the decrease in the capacity of, of hepatitis C related uh, conditions. So, Getting into this model and the Markov model, the elimination of uh, HCV within Canada, um, you know, represents a truly remarkable course of events. And even talking about it is just phenomenal. Thank you, Scott. You've laid out um, really a very nice uh, map for achieving elimination. Tony, since the CDC first put out their guidance, uh, many clinicians have focused on the hepatitis C screening in the boomer population uh, between 1945 and 1965 birthdays. Um, and I think we've incorporated this very well uh, in my institution and others. Uh, we put in EPIC screening uh, or other EMR-based screening based on birth year and birth cohort. Um, but the demographics of hepatitis C are really changing, aren't they? Yeah, it, it's completely shifted. Um, you know, we knew from that old data from the NHANES data, the majority of people in the U.S. who had chronic hep C were born between 1945 and 1965. At one point, they represented 75% of those who had hep C. But I think that those of you who are listening and watching this tonight, if you're treating hep C right now, you've seen a complete shift in who has it. And it, this is just a segment, if we look at new cases from 2018, almost 138,000 new cases, almost 60% of these individuals are younger. Uh, these are the Gen X uh, group, these are the millennials. And a lot of this is, is driven by uh, the injection drug use crisis that we see. And you know, when we talk about injection drug use, I don't want you to just think it's an opiate problem, although that is fueling it. Uh, in some parts of the country, it's methamphetamine or cocaine, but this is, an issue uh, has become a disease state of the young. And I think that that's what we've seen, at least in my practice, it's been a long time since I've seen a baby boomer. Uh, primarily, it's all young people under the age of 40. And you can see almost half of these patients with hep C uh, on the bottom in the green, you can see what states they live in. And some of these places have been hit very hard by the injection drug use crisis. So I'm, I'm not surprised by this data. Yeah, thank you for bringing that current perspective. I think it uh, it's, it's, it really speaks to how hepatitis C has dramatically changed just in the, uh, it was literally 2014 when we had the first all oral DAA therapies available. Now the key issue in elimination is screening and that brings us to our first learning objective, which is to implement HCV screening for all adults and at-risk populations, including people who inject drugs and women who are pregnant. Before we move into the data, I would like to get our audience involved. So, uh, Tony, what's your response to uh, these results? Well, I'm, I'm glad to see uh, stigma is low. And I think it's interesting that there's a, a need for additional education about who to screen and who to treat. Um, you know, and then the asymptomatic disease, I think, points to the need for more education, because I think a lot of us that have been around hep C, you know, there's frequently no symptoms. It's considered to be mostly asymptomatic early on, but we know that long term downstream, as you develop more fibrosis, you become at risk for developing cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, need for liver transplant. So I think these are two important uh, aspects to take away from this that highlight the need for you know, even programs like we're doing tonight. Scott, do you have any comments? No, I, I'm, I'm going to be talking about, you know, the, the interaction with uh, the health system with pregnant women. And, uh, you know, and that has some of the, you know, unique uh, capabilities of linking into the, into the system. So um, I find the, the results to be very promising on this uh, small survey. 
Yeah, I think I think so too. And what I find really uh, almost touching uh, and um, reassuring is the fact that stigma associated with HCV was lowest. Yeah, um, and that tells me that we've made a lot of progress in terms of recognizing that uh, we shouldn't blame the victim for having this uh, potentially life-threatening disease. Tony, let's talk about at-risk populations. Um, first, let's talk about people who inject drugs and their risk for HCV infection, because the numbers are really quite dramatic, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, this has always sort of been the uh, the heart and soul of hep C. You know, even in the early days, this was one of the major drivers. And, and today, in the, new, the newer era of hep C, or phase two of hep C, I guess, uh, this is really the driver. And we know that most people who inject drugs, uh, more than half of them are chronically infected with hep C. And 80% of the new infections that we're seeing uh, are directly related to injection drug use. And part of the problem is that, like, we, we've showed you that this is a younger demographic. And younger people who inject drugs, they tend to share much more frequently than older patients who have a history of substance use. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they don't yet know the rules to the game. Uh, they don't understand that they acquire hep C shortly after they begin injecting, typically right after they start. They don't know that hep C can survive not only in the needle, in the syringe, but also on the implements that are used to prepare drugs. So whether you're using uh, cocaine or heroin, methamphetamine, uh, these products have to be prepared. So they're typically cooked in a spoon, drawn up through a cotton filter. And a lot of times the younger patients they hear the message, don't reuse needles and syringes, but they have to also be given the harm reduction education that hep C can survive on these other implements of use. And hep C is transmitted at a rate that's 10 times that of HIV. So, you know, this is a population that is disproportionately affected by hep C, but also very efficient at transmitting it and perpetuating infection. Yeah, excellent point. Uh, I still remember uh, a couple of anecdotes. The first is I saw a patient who was close to 70 years of age, uh, who, who was a heroin uh, user uh, mm. for uh, 50 years. Um, and he had hepatitis C, but he was meticulous about how um, he had uh, used, uh, he, he never shared any of the uh, any of the uh, tools, etc., and um, uh, and 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 it was amazing to me that that a patient could sustain a heroin addiction for that long uh, without without having um, a bad illness. I also remember this paper that came out about uh, seven or eight years ago, uh, suggesting that hepatitis C can survive uh, outside of a biological environment uh, right. on dried surfaces for. Um, up to weeks. And yeah. so it's not surprising that uh, uh, the data, I think, suggests that an individual that's used intravenous drugs for more than six months has a greater than 90% chance of being HCV positive. Uh, right. So I think uh, not focusing on this population and giving them the opportunity to be treated and cured uh, is sort of missing the boat, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I um, totally agree. Tony, what is the effect of increasing injection frequency on the infection rate? So we've yeah. talked about injection I mean, use, but uh, it's it's climbing, isn't it? Yeah, and, and this I think that the, the next couple of slides just highlight how effectively uh, patients who are injecting tend to transmit. So on this slide here, you can see that just by, by injecting less than daily and then escalating to daily use, uh, it increases the rate of hep C infection 67%. So, you know, the, the likelihood that you're going to become infected, exactly like you just said, Chris, by increasing your use um, is very high. It's exceedingly high. And you can see here, I mean, when you, you, it's not just increasing the frequency of use, but increasing the number of people whom you use with. So every time you introduce a new uh, partner into the use network, you increase the incidence rate or the number of the, the rate of new cases of Hep C uh, from 5.8 to 6.9 infections per 100 person years. So you can see from these two slides, by increasing your use to daily, every time you introduce somebody new into, the, into that network, you're perpetuating spread, you're speeding and accelerating transmission, which I think is why it, it highlights the need 
to engage this treatment in screening, linkage, and treatment. Because if we're going to hit those targets that Scott was talking about at the very beginning of the talk, by 2030, this is the population that we need to engage so that we can prevent this continued transmission. Thank you. Very compelling. Scott, uh, let's talk about another population, uh, pregnant women. Um, what is the estimated prevalence of HCV RNA positivity in pregnant women? And how does it compare to the total number of HCV positive adult population uh, by state? And uh, Chris, thank you. And, uh, you know, when Tony was mentioning, you know, about taking that aspect of looking at injection drug users, and, you know, that's one area within the health system. When you look at this graph within pregnant women and you look at the RNA positivity of the population in total, you know, within the population within the pregnant women, this is another hot spot where we can meet uh, within the confines of the health system and start testing within that pregnancy and that pregnant, you know, cohort. And when you look at the areas within the, the states, I mean, you look at West Virginia, Kentucky, even Vermont, when you look at the, that area, and then even going down to like Tennessee, you know, there's a big difference between Eastern Tennessee and Western Tennessee, and, you know, the, the population and the demographics within the, uh, that even one state and everything. But when you really look at how this curve comes in with that dark purple and looking at the positivity, you know, of our uh, HCV RNA um, within the uh, public, uh, within the pregnancy cohort, I mean, these are phenomenal numbers. And this is an area, not only can we look at the injection drug user, but we can also look at the pregnant women cohort. And then this is an area that we can have interaction with the health system and find the you know appropriate cohort and we can look at within these states and it's just a overwhelming you know number within the you know a prevalence perspective yeah I scott think I, I, this this right. makes sense right i mean we've we've highlighted that the demographic is skewing younger and i think that what we didn't get in there is that we're seeing more and more young females who are infected this tended in the old days to be you know uh, three to one male to female. And I can, I can tell you in our practice, it's almost a 50, 50 split at this point. So it makes sense that the younger females are, are getting infected with hep C and they become pregnant. Uh, and if you look at some of these top three States, these are States that have been heavily hit by injection drug use with methamphetamine, West Virginia, especially, um, the risk of vertical transmission is around 6% in a mono infected female passing it on to, to her child. And what we, I don't know that we have it in these slides, but you know, it, it really, we have this new sort of ghost cohort of children who are being born, the hep C positive moms. And, you know, we know that there were about 1700 kids born per year. I mean, it's a lot of kids and it, it makes sense when you see some of these numbers that you're showing here with the rates of positivity. And then yeah. uh, Tony, on top of that, you know, um, you know, injection drug use, you know, what I think is so profound, what you said before is just not heroin, but, you know, I've, you know, in the addiction clinic, um, you know, I see a tremendous amount of meth use and injection meth use. And, you know, I think when you, you know, mentioned that, you know, the, the, the states in Appalachia, you know, that you see that have these highest cohorts, you know, for, uh, pregnant women, you know, there's a tremendous amount of, of injection drug use and quite a bit of that is uh, meth related and not necessarily just opiate related. So, right. uh, you know, we have to be able to, to look at that all. And then one of the things on the follow on for the next slide is that, you know, when we look at this, um, when you really look at this universal screening and we can look at this 5 million, you know, pregnant women cohort per, per year, um, and you look at the number of women that we can look at and we can detect is 33,000 women. And that what Tony said, you know, beforehand is that with this increased detection, we can get an estimated 300 children born to infected mothers. Um, those numbers are, you know, critical. And because of the, the touch point that they have with the health system, you know, within, you know, pregnancy, you know, it's a great avenue and a great way to get this HCV screening done uh, within that you know, pregnancy uh, timeframe. 
And so not only that, but when you look at it, it's also cost effective using, you know, quality adjusted of life years when you use $25,000 per treatment. So not only is it a great way to identify people with, you know, HCV, and then over a lifetime, it's also cost effective. Yeah, so I think you've both convincingly made the case that we should be screening uh, pregnant women uh, with universal screening. Uh, Tony, recently the CDC and the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force updated their recommendations for HCV screening among adults in the U.S. with some really profound and uh, very impactful recommendations. Uh, what is new? Can you take us through it? Yeah, I think that this reflects, this is the CDC recommendations that were just updated, and it's a move toward, uh, a nudge toward universal screening, I, I, I would argue. Um, one of the main things here is they recommend hep C screening of all individuals ages 18 and over, uh, except in settings where the hep C prevalence is exceedingly low, less than 0.1%. So basically, this is saying, you know, regardless of a risk factor, if you're uh, an adult human aged 18 or older, we should screen you for hep C. They also recommend that we screen all pregnant women uh, during each pregnancy, which I think is a very, that's a very important uh, uh, add to this. What's still there is the risk-based screening, um, all patients with HIV, uh, the things that you're familiar with, anyone who's ever injected drugs, anyone who's had a blood transfusion, blood products or organ transplant before 1992, uh, healthcare workers who may have had a needle stick, and also children born to hep C positive women. Uh, like I said, I think that's a really important um, cohort that is, is starting to emerge. They recommend periodic testing in people who are currently injecting. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that down the line. Uh, and then anybody with select medical conditions. So if you have a patient who's on dialysis, that's obviously... Um, historically been considered a risk factor that's important to, to screen people for. Um, so some important steps toward universal screening, I think, here, uh, and, and, a, and a big push in the right direction to help identify people. Thank you for taking us through that. Uh, what are the differences between the CDC recommendations and the USPSTF guidelines? Yeah, there's two big ones. And one has to do with the age cutoff. So CDC says anybody over the age of 18, 18 and up, uh, the US Preventative Task Force caps that out at age 79. So they say anybody ages 18 to 79 should have one time testing regardless of a risk factor. So the cap is different there. And then the uh, US Preventative Task Force recommends testing of all pregnant females, but they don't specify with each pregnancy. Um, so there's some subtle differences here. Um, it'd be nice to see these kind of sync up. Uh, I, I think that I would lean toward the CDC recommendations here uh, because I think they're more encompassing, uh, more inclusive, and they hit all the high-risk groups. Yeah, thank you. And uh, the ACOG are also different, right? Yeah, so ACOG, uh, the American College of uh, OBGYN, uh, they still don't recommend routine screening uh, in, the, in the pregnant female cohort, um, but they are actively reviewing both the CDC and the U.S. Uh, Preventative Task Force recommendations in the, in the updated guidances. So I would expect that we would see something come from ACOG, uh, you know, but it's they, still being looked at at this point, and there, there's no consensus there as yet. So we have a we have a lot of questions coming in, and I'm going to pause to answer a, to take a couple of them now. Uh, obviously, an immediate question is: Well, if you screen a woman who's pregnant, um, or you find a newborn who is HCV positive after screening a pregnant woman, um, are there uh, what do the recommendations and guidelines say about treatment? Are we treating those patients? Uh, Tony, do you have any comment on that? No, so we're, we're right now, pregnant women who uh, are, are hep C positive is sort of the next frontier, so to speak. Uh, this is a very important group because if we could get to a point where we could treat these women in the third trimester, which is not the current recommendation, but this is an area of study and debate. If we could treat women in that third trimester, we could prevent vertical transmission. So you're effectively treating two people uh, two human lives that you're eradicating the disease from. That said, we, we can't do it. 
It's important, however, to identify those females so that we can continue to follow the children. Hep C treatment has evolved to the point now where we can treat kids as, uh, I think down, we're down to age three. Uh, there's weight-based dosing, but we can effectively get children treated and cured before they enter school and face social stigma or school-based stigmas that may uh, impact them. So it's, a, it's important that we screen and identify the women so that one, we can treat them post-delivery. Uh, a lot of times, like Scott was saying before, this is an important touch point with the healthcare system. So they may have insurance for a few more months uh, post-delivery. And that becomes important because immediately we could get them treated in eight or 12 weeks uh, and eradicate the infection, preventing transmission of future pregnancies, for example. And we can also identify the children. So uh, for, for treatment, once they become age and weight appropriate. So I think that there's a lot of, uh, of upside to, to identify uh, these females and the children. And there are treatment options that are, are there for the kids and hopefully that are going to emerge for uh, the women before they deliver. And Tony, it's uh, Scott, it, it almost sounds like, you know, the, the landmark paper 076 for HIV, um, where they, you know, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, you know, where yep. they started treating pregnant women with, uh, you know, uh, antiretrovirals. And then slowly, you know, it, you know, now with such surveillance, um, very few children are born HIV positive. So I, I have a feeling that it will go down along those same lines will the, where there will be such surveillance that maybe we can eliminate, you know, even the transmission to, uh, to children. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, this trends kind of in the same way. And there's already been uh, some landmark studies, very small groups, the ends or maybe 10 patients uh, where they've been treated and it's worked. Um, there's been no uh, downstream adverse events. The children were fine. Um, and I think it's especially important to investigate the pregnant female cohort because the way our system is, it's so fragmented. Uh, we know that 50% of these children born to hep C positive moms end up in the foster care system. And it further uh, creates issues in, in that continuity of care where, you know, we lose track of the health records. A lot of times uh, pregnant women don't want to disclose their ongoing risk factor because they're afraid when the child's born, they haven't disclosed that they're continuing to inject drugs and you know, they, they are afraid the child might be taken away. So there's all sorts of pitfalls in, in the way that the U.S. system is, de is designed. So it's exceedingly important that we identify these women and children. And that's great. One, a great discussion and um, obviously a hot topic. Um, and if we have time, we can maybe resume this at the end. Uh, let's switch gears now, uh, Scott, and talk about uh, who to screen, uh, from who to screen to how to screen. Uh, and we really want your uh, personal insight being in a primary care setting, how a, a provider should move forward with the typical steps for screening. Oh, uh, thank you, Chris. Um, you know what, this is more of a, just a binary uh, type of situation and being the family practitioner, being on the front lines and identifying uh, patients. Um, when, when we get to, to patients, you know, within the, those risk factors, you know, and getting a HCV antibody test, it's just really binary. If they come back with a positive antibody test, get the PCR, if they have a positive PCR, it's an active infection. If it's negative, you know what, then that's the area that you can counsel the patient, you know, confirm if they're, you know, actively using, you know, and then not only that, but then if they're negative on the PCR, then that's where you can go into those secondary, if they're available, drug and alcohol treatment, counseling, harm reduction, et cetera. So anytime that I come in to contact with the patient, get my HCV antibody test, the PCR is just reflexive and that determines, you know, how I talk to the patient afterwards. That's great. You really made it simple uh, and any provider should be able to order these tests. An important factor, Scott, for both surveillance of liver cancer and selection of medications is staging uh, of hepatic fibrosis in patients with HCV. And I know you're gonna tell us that um, the vast majority of patients uh, really with all stages, um, maybe with the exception of advanced liver disease such as cirrhosis or decompensated liver disease, 
uh, can be treated by the primary care provider. Uh, but it is important for the PCP to know how to stage the patient. Um, what are some methods that are currently used for staging hepatic fibrosis? Oh, I, I think this is where the paradigm shift is going to occur. And being a primary care physician who's treated hepatitis C uh, for almost uh, two decades, um, you know, uh, the paradigm and being able to eliminate, you know, HCV by 2030, even though that was in Canada, we can do it in the US, um, it's gonna have to have that paradigm shift from the experts, uh, the hepatologists, and moving that forward into the primary care space and having that comfort, that comfort and that you know, understanding of how to use DAAs and how to stage patients appropriately. And then not only that, but refer the patients to the hepatologists that need referring. So at this point in time, um, you know what, liver biopsy, you know what, we don't really use liver biopsy anymore. I haven't sent anyone off for a liver bi biopsy for quite some time. But anytime that I get somebody that has, you know, a positive PCR, then the easiest thing to do is to get a Fib4. That's just a simple test that utilizes platelets, AST, ALT, and age. And then it gives you a, a, a value that can determine if there's fibrosis that's, uh, that's available, uh, fibrosis that's, uh, that's inherent. And so the problem with the Fib4 is that there's a large indeterminate range. And so you may not have any idea. Uh, whether there's a fibrosis or not. So you have to go down to another, you know, further step. So in my practice, I have FiberScan, which is a uh, transient elastography. And I'm probably one of the very few primary care physicians that have access to this in the clinic. And that gives me the ability to look at a certain score to determine, you know, kind of which stage of fibrosis that we're in. So anytime that you have somebody that is in advanced fibrosis, stage three, stage four, stage four meaning cirrhotic, all of those patients should in fact be transferred over to the hepatologist for treatment. And the paradigm shift in order, in order for us to eliminate you know, HCV, primary care physicians, and since we have a younger cohort that are you know, engaged in HCV positivity, that means that we should be able to, as primary care physicians, treat members with no fibrosis, stage one, stage two fibrosis, or F1, F2 fibrosis. And so that's how that um, paradigm shift uh, should occur. So there are uh, uh, several different stages based on the Metavir system. Um, and um, uh, it would be interesting if we have some time to get into a discussion about uh, the F3 patients, I might argue that even a patient that is F3 but not cirrhotic um, yet uh, could be treated in a primary care setting. Uh, I'd love to get input from others later on that. But can you just kind of walk us through, because when you order a test like a fibro test or a fibro scan or get a biopsy, there's a description of stages. So Scott, just briefly, can you just go through these stages and what they mean? Because one thing I do notice is that patients get very scared when they hear the term stage four, because obviously they think of stage four cancer. Um, but it's quite different when you're talking about histologic staging, which is what most of our non-invasive tests are also drawn from, right? Absolutely. And so just going from the stages F1 to F4, you know, F4 being cirrhosis, and I, we all have an understanding of what, you know, cirrhotics, uh, you know, that, that terminology. But stage three means that there's, you know, extensive fibrosis, stage two, that there's some limited fibrosis, stage one, there's just some inflammation, you know, associated uh, with the liver. And so for me, when I take a look at stage three and stage four, definitively stage four, the cirrhotics, the scarred, uh, you know, damaged liver, you know, they definitely go off to the, you know, the hepatologist. Stage three, um, Chris, I, I could I could agree that uh, that we would want to treat those once we get some patients underneath our belt, and you know depending on how much uh, cirrhosis is there and fibrosis, and looking at different avenues, especially with fiber scan, in order to tell us you know where we are within that spectrum. And uh, Scott, I'm putting you to work a lot here. Uh, if you want to take a sip of water, 
what are some pre-treatment assessment and tests that a primary care provider should need to perform uh, before deciding on a treatment regimen? It's not a lot of things, but there's a few basic things that the PCP should do, right? Absolutely. And so when we have this, um, you know, what? I, I think it's just kind of inherent that we always get, you know, CBC, liver enzymes, ASDLT, bilirubin, albumin, creatinine. And then, you know, we always want to make sure that they don't have a uh, co-infection with, you know, hepatitis B, H, HIV, hepatitis A. And then obviously, you know, one of the biggest uh, markers for uh, determining, you know, uh, the direction of fibrosis or cirrhosis is the platelet count. And so once we take a look at that general, you know, area, if we get that and the platelet counts are over 150 and, you know, the AST, ALT, all that is kind of within normal limits, they should be able to be treated by, you know, the primary care physician and being able to initiate DAA. And we should be able to perform, you know, that piece and essentially, it's more about public health and being able to be a primary care, primary care physician within the public health environment by being able to eliminate the virus, because we're talking about elimination here. And so anytime that you have, you know, uh, areas that are outside of this uh, confine so that there's, you know, if you have EGFRs less than 30 being, you know, stage four chronic kidney disease, you know, uncontrolled diabetes, platelet counts you know, less than a hundred decompensated cirrhosis or anyone that looks like they have F3 or F4, um, you know, uh, fibrosis cirrhosis, we have to then perform, you know, if there's hepatocellular carcinoma and take a look and look at the integrity of the liver. Anytime that we have any of those areas where we want to consult to the HCV specialist, that's when we refer the patient out. But otherwise, everyone on that left-hand side as a primary care physician we should have, you know, the capability of initiating DAA, and we should have that um, comfortability of doing that too. Yeah, no, I would say certainly um, having worked in large health systems and done a variety of different types of uh, mentoring uh, for uh, people learning how to treat HCV who are uh, PCPs, uh, whether it's through just uh, electronic medical record, uh, telementoring, Project Echo, et cetera, uh, the uh, the reassurance and the confidence uh, that a, the primary care providers get is very quick. And in contrast to most of the chronic diseases that we manage, um, uh, you know, um, PCPs love treating hepatitis C because it's something you can cure with eight weeks of therapy or 12 weeks of therapy. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's an extraordinarily uh, reassuring, uh, you know, it's grat gratifying. And uh, Chris, so Tony, from a specialist point of view, um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about kind of how you would uh, handle these patients a little differently if, they, if you see a patient with uh, cirrhosis uh, F4 or maybe has a platelet count that's a little bit lower um, than normal um, in clinical practice? And um, uh, obviously, we're going to partner with the PCPs, even with the patients with cirrhosis, because they may come and see you, but you're probably going to recommend that they go back to the PCP, have HCC surveillance, et cetera. So what are some tips for uh, kind of managing that patient that obviously decompensated patients need to be at a, with a hepatologist, but uh, how about that patient that's F F4, or, you know, or maybe F3, but definitely the F4 patient who's still compensated? Yeah, I think it, it becomes important here to just kind of understand some of the nuances of treatment. Um, if you have that F4 patient, it may de you, the, the, the treatment regimen that you opt to utilize uh, may vary, um, depending if they've ever had a history of decompensation, for example. Um, you know, some tips that I would give would just really pay attention to those basic labs. Look at the albumin. If, you, if the albumin's low and the total bilirubin's high and the platelets are low, you've, you've got your tip off right there that the patient is most likely cirrhotic. Proceed directly to ultrasound uh, to confirm it. You, you know, you look on the imaging for stigmata of cirrhosis, you'll see a big spleen, a big portal vein diameter. The liver may look nodular. Um, you may even pick up some varices there. Uh, all of those patients need a baseline EGD to assess for esophageal or gastric varices. 
the HCC surveillance is critically important. So once you identify that patient who's F3, I would argue starting at F3 uh, and beyond, they need imaging every six months to assess for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. That's lifelong. That goes on for the, for the rest of the patient's life. Uh, the, the AFP is very, you know, it's nonspecific. Uh, the guidances, the guidelines kind of vary around who utilizes it and who doesn't. I would say that we get one at baseline and then it kind of, we use it more in those patients who have HCC to sort of follow trends in disease progression. But uh, the, the critical things here are the surveillance studies. One of the tip I would say is um, if you have a patient that's new to you, that's coming in, really pay attention to the medication list. The patient looks, may look very well compensated. They have a low MELD score. Um, the labs look okay, but the med list has got listed spironolactone or furosemide or lactulose, natalol, uh, something called zyfaxin. These are tip-offs that once upon a time, that patient who may be very well compensated today, at some point was decompensated. And if you see those medications listed there, it's going to direct what you choose in terms of treatment for the hep C. And I think that then you really want to make sure you're working uh, especially close with the specialists. Excellent point. So I think a patient that recompensates that previously was decompensated, they had a variceal bleed, they had ascites that's now gone away, um, they had a bleeding episode, and now they're back to normal. Even if they look fine now, that's a different patient than a patient with cirrhosis that never decompensated where the management is not rocket science. It's surveillance for cancer, nutrition, and screening for portal hypertension. Tony, there's been some new developments with regard to the use of uh, uh, DAAs in patients with uh, CKD or end-stage renal disease. Can you quickly touch on some of the points that uh, providers may need to know about that? Yeah, really, I mean, in the, in the old days with hep C and the, the medications that we had available, especially interferon and then some of the uh, other oral agents, this was sort of one of those special populations. But hep C treatment, we're going to talk a little bit more about this uh, a few slides down the way. It's really a two-horse race at this point. So whether you're using a soft base regimen or you're using GP, both of these medication regimens are indicated for patients who have end-stage renal disease, including patients who are on dialysis. So some of the renal impairment um, uh, specialty is, is fallen off a little bit here. So um, you have treatment options for these individuals. Great, thanks. Let's now move on to our second learning objective, which is to address gaps and linkage to care by developing new methods for primary care provider specialist coordinated care, uh, and to look at new ways for partnership to optimize the HCV care cascade. So with the new direct acting antivirals, primary care providers are well positioned to initiate treatment. Um, we'd like to hear from the audience now about what barriers they might face related to initiating treatment. Um, Scott, uh, any, anything that, uh, while you're reading this, um, anything that surprises you? Um, what's kind of interesting is that the concern that patients will not adhere to treatment, um, you know, that that's moved over, you know, that, that looks, uh, and I think Tony will be able to comment on many of that because he's got a co-located clinic. Uh, with the with patients and being treated, I think that's something quite interesting, you know, to me when I look at the top three barriers. Tony, yeah, I agree. Um, I think that the adherence piece, uh, and we'll we'll I think we'll see some data about this. But um, these patients are, if we're specifically talking about uh, PWID or people who inject drugs, it's a very adherent group. Um, I can tell you in my clinic, it's a co-located program, and we looked at adherence among patients who were actively using drugs and non-injectors. Uh, and the people who inject drugs were actually more adherent by 10% compared to a non-injecting population. And it's the exact same model. There's no differences whatsoever. Um, which, so it's really interesting. And if there's a large body of historical data around adherence in, in injection drug users, and I'll show you a little bit more down the line, but um, hopefully we can allay some of those fears. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's great. And it may speak to the fact that maybe, the, maybe we as, uh, as providers also need some education 
uh, not only about uh, uh, our own um, understanding, but our own, um, you know, historical grasp. And I think the uh, the uh, CME Outfitters team clearly was taking note of the fact that need ed additional education about initiating treatment is uh, is also very high in terms of number of people responding. Scott, speaking of uh, challenges that providers may trade may face. Let's talk about some of the attitudes and behaviors related to screening. Yes. Um, you know, it's interesting. The, the one that stuck out was the adherence uh, and treatment. And then the second piece was the initiation of treatment. And so this was a small study in, in Washington, D.C., you know, regarding, um, you know, the, the screening and treatment within HCV. And if you look at like the first two uh, kind of statements there, it's kind of important to be, you know, to identify, to identify risk factors, treatment in the community is actually very important. But when you look at that second line, you know, coming down, you're seeing that, will HCV treatment benefit my clinic? Yes. And then the two decisive, you know, areas that are here, um, you know, should, you know, DAA, should be continued to be provided primarily by specialists? I like that answer, 40%. So that means that 60% said that, um, that they have you know, the possibility or the potential for um, treating. And then the era of uh, interferon-free DA, DAA treatments for treating HCV should be provided by the PCPs. That's 35%. But given those two responses, I think that, you know, there's people that would like to, you know, initiate that treatment, but they just haven't had enough experience in, in taking that next step of actually prescribing those uh, DAAs. And when you look at the number of 59%, they just refer out to GI, ID, or hepatologist, you know, I think we can bring that number down. But what I like about this is that it looks like there's a potential willingness for a primary care to engage in the active treatment of HCV, especially non-serotic members. Yeah, no, I would, I would argue that this number should be much higher in terms of uh, uh, PCPs treating patients because in fact, many gastroenterologists uh, probably uh, do not f treat fewer hepatitis C patients than uh, than many primary care providers, certainly in our environment, uh, where hepatologists are doing a lot of transplant medicine and seeing patients who are decompensated, uh, we've really uh, tried to encourage the PCPs to treat patients. Now, there are some unique challenges in rural communities, uh, particularly with regard to access to specialists. But this is, uh, you know, as you pointed out in West Virginia, um, this some of these rural communities is where hepatitis C infections are growing the fastest, uh, and the barriers uh, are not. A trivial. Scott, share some of the insights from the survey, please. And and you look at this and you see the the information that was you know reported before with you know pregnant women the seropositive rates uh, with po uh, pregnant women. You look at the injection drug use. You know whether it's methamphetamine or whether it's you know opiates. Um, you see that and it's in rural communities. And in those rural communities, they you know may not have the same structures there as there are in, you know, urban settings. And, you know, many of these areas are the hotspots. So, you know, from this, in order for us to, to kind of, you know, reduce or eliminate, you know, hepatitis C, you know, infections, you know, we're going to need that rural community and those rural physicians to engage, especially in the primary care uh, environment, and especially if the cohort of positive HCV members are now of younger cohorts and their staging of fibrosis is probably much lower. And given, you know, the, the ability to look at laboratory values and being able to see, you know, and then taking a fiber shore or fiber scan at the next step and seeing that where they are within the fibrosis uh, scoring, you know, when you look at this, it's going to be critical for the rural communities to initiate treatment at the primary care level. Yeah, with that, let me move on to the next uh, question for you, Scott. Um, now that we uh, know the DAAs are very easy to use, uh, especially because we've eliminated interferon, we've eliminated ribavarin, um, they have almost no side effects. Is there any reason for a primary care physician not to treat 
hepatitis C patient, other than lack of uh, comfort or knowledge uh, in treating, uh, being comfortable or knowledgeable in treating hepatitis C? Oh, you know, I, the, when I started uh, treating, you know, uh, a hepatologist and an infectious disease uh, physician, you know, held my hand through, you know, uh, through, the, through the longitudinal course of, of treatment. You know, once I, you know, identified the patients and when they were all non serotic patients, um, you know, and I had my own algorithm and it was quite, you know, uh, accommodating to, to treat. And, and as you said before, it was really nice, you know, getting a, actually a sustained viral suppression and a cure, you know, for something. And so up in that block one, initiating HCV treatment, you know, I think can, eat, can be done in that primary care setting as long as, you know, you don't have those comorbidities and you don't have that serotic and certainly not decompensated serotic, they need to go to the specialist. And then not only that, but what uh, Tony said was the co co-location of clinics. I'm an addictionologist uh, in addition. And so I get to see, you know, not only primary care, but also the, the addiction component to it too. And so I prescribe a lot of buprenorphine and send a lot of people to residential uh, treatment, but having that community to support, you know, from the primary care and then electronically, I'm actually linked into the hepatologist. You know, I may not see the hepatologist, but from the EMR, um, I have that access to, uh, to the hepatologist and the hepatologist knows because I have fiber scan, you know, that I can identify the, the advanced fibrotics and then the serotics. Um, and they know that they're only getting the most difficult cases and I'm not overwhelming their clinic at all. And so that's something that's, that's really been really nice is creating that bond with the hepatologist and, and an infectious disease specialist where, you know what, they know that when I have problems, that means that they're getting a, a very difficult patient that I don't know how to treat and I shouldn't be treating and that should only go to the hepatologist. And then lastly, um, you know, that education, I think linking on to an infectious disease specialist or a hepatologist for your first several patients is just critical in prescribing DAAs. And uh, then not only that, but doing HCC surveillance, you know, once you get into that rhythm, um, as Tony mentioned in the past, um, previously, you know what, it will become kind of rote and then you'll feel much more comfortable in prescribing DAAs. Great, thank you. Uh, Tony, uh, let's, get, let's get to the heart of the matter. Uh, what is a typical approach used for treatment and monitoring? And then we'll talk a little bit more about available treatment. So please take it away. Yeah, this, is, this has gotten really simple. Um, you know, in order to eradicate disease on a widespread scale, you have to be able to treat all the different types. So you need a pan-genotypic regimen. I told you it's a two horse race. So you're gonna pick your regimen here eight or 12 weeks, do your assessment for drug-drug interactions. The patient completes the duration of treatment and you wait three months. You wait a period of 12 weeks post-completion of treatment and you check the viral load again. If it's negative, the patient's cured. Don't be afraid to use the word cure. I, we hear all the time, dormant, in remission. It, this is a curable disease state. Now, theoretically, you could initiate treatment, not see the patient again until the end. Uh, uh, but, you know, I think a lot of us would recommend that you have an optional on treatment visit to monitor for adherence, to uh, assess lab data. You know, if the patient's ever been exposed to hepatitis B in the past, that's an important uh, touch that needs to be done that you need to check the labs. If at the end of treatment, any time in that 12-month period, the patient is still viremic, there's treatment options available. But at that point, I would really consult with a hep C specialist. Great. So now let's get to the specific available treatments, dosage, indications, and side effects. Please tell us. Yeah. Tony. So you've got two regimens available, uh, both of which treat all the different genotypes, all six genotypes, including the subtypes. So let's begin in the middle here with Softvel, which most of you know is Eplusa. This is a 12-week regimen, whether you're serotic or non-serotic. This is the only regimen that's indicated for those individuals who are decompensated cirrhotics. This is a single tablet. It's taken once daily with or without food. There's no food effect. 
very well tolerated. Um, patients have minimal side effects. If they do, it tends to be mild headache, fatigue, a little bit of nausea. Anybody experiences those, we tend to tell them to take it at night before they go to bed. There's a few key drug-drug interactions. Uh, amiodarone cannot be used with any soft-based, sofosfavir-based regimen uh, at the risk of developing symptomatic bradycardia. Um, Epclusa should also not be used with any, uh, with certain of the anticonvulsants at the risk that you decrease the efficacy of the hep C meds, actually. Um, you have to avoid proton pump inhibitors. If it's absolutely necessary, you can use uh, up to a maximum dose of omeprazole, 20 milligrams. Uh, but there's very specific dosing guidelines as to when to take acid suppression uh, agents if you have to use them while they're on uh, the Epclusa. The, the, the medication requires an acidic environment to absorb properly. Now, the next regimen we have available is uh, GP, also called Maveret. This is an eight-week regimen. Whether you're cirrhotic or not, uh, it's... Um, going to be an eight week duration. Very important to point out here, this regimen is not indicated for decompensated cirrhotics. So these are your high meld patients who have a child pew B or C uh, score who have had a history of prior decompensation. So this regimen contains a protease inhibitor, uh, which in those individuals can result in a bad outcome. So you don't want to use this in your decompensated uh, patients. One big difference uh, is compared to the Epclusa is that this is three tablets, but it's still once daily dosing. So you're going to take all three pills together uh, with food and it's not a heavy meal. It can be taken with a snack. Um, same side effect profile. I can tell you that, you know, we, we always in the clinical trials, you collect all these side effects. Um, utilizing both regimens in over probably 3000 people in the past few years, we've never had anybody discontinue due to side effects. Um, some of the other important drug-drug interactions here uh, re relate to statins, supplements such as St. John's wort. Uh, there's a very good website, HEP Interactions, uh, that you can Google. You can plug in all the patient's medications, and it'll kick back any potential DDIs. So I encourage anybody, before you pick your regimen or when you pick it, do a careful uh, review of the patient's med list. Utilize that website and, and just cross-check everything. Some important drugs that have no interactions, um, progestin-only contraceptives. If the patient's on an estrogen-based oral contraceptive, uh, there's an interaction with Maveret, and that needs to be avoided. Calcium channel blockers are fine, methadone, buprenorphine. We'll talk more about those on the next slide. Yeah, so uh, very simple, 8 to 12 weeks uh, based, on the, based on the regimen and based on the patient characteristics and 98% or higher cures with both regimens. So extraordinary. Uh, now we've talked about patients uh, who, people who inject drugs, and many of them are on medication associated treatment. Um, can you tell us about any interactions with these? Yeah, so I, I can tell you that whatever regimen you choose, whether it's uh, GP, Maveret, or Softvel, Clusa, or any other sofosfavir containing uh, a regimen like Harvoni, um, there's no interaction with methadone. Um, on the slide, buprenorphine lights up in yellow uh, for a potential interaction um, with the soft base regimens. And that potential interaction is that the buprenorphine levels may decrease a little bit. Um, I can tell you, this is exactly the world that I live in with my hep C patients. Um, almost 100% of them are on opiate substitution therapy or medically assisted therapy. And I can tell you, we've never had to adjust the buprenorphine um, dosing one way or the other on any of the regimens, and we utilize both Maveret and Epclusa. So this, I think, is a theoretical potential interaction, um, but, but in general, in, in real-world clinical practice, there's really no interactions to speak of with any of this. Very reassuring and, and very straightforward. So, um, so Tony, a patient has had a cure now. What are some of the post-cure management steps that healthcare providers should perform after treating patients. Okay, so it's important that we continue to educate, that we continue our harm reduction measures. So I told you, you wait 12 weeks, you check the viral load. If it's negative, you're cured. It doesn't mean that you, can get, you can't get reinfected. So if the patient you know, should relapse to drug use, uh, to injection drug use, they can get the same type of hep C, they can get a new genotype. So we constantly have to educate about that. And 
counsel regarding, you know, alcohol use and weight reduction, if they have concomitant uh, fatty liver disease, for example, anybody who's still at risk. So if they're on opiate substitution therapy and maybe their toxicology turns up positive uh, for an illicit substance, that may trigger you to check a viral load to assess for any potential reinfection. Can't stress enough the box that's in gray. All your patients who undergo treatment for hep C, if they are F3 or more, F3 or F4 fibrotics, they need to be constantly, every six months, that it is of the utmost importance that they undergo that surveillance for HCC with imaging every six months. So very uh, clear and useful. Um, so there are several questions here, and I hope we'll get to some. But one of the questions was, what is FibroScan um, uh, staging uh, for cirrhosis? Um, um, Tony, can you tell us kind of how you use FibroScan very briefly to say sure. what is a level at which you would say this patient may have cirrhosis or likely has cirrhosis? Yeah. Look, really simply, a FibroScan is like a very specialized ultrasound. It tells you two things. It tells you how what percentage of the liver is... Uh, has fat accumulation. So you get one score that tells you the degree of steatosis. And then it measures how stiff the liver is. So the patient has to be fasting because if they have a heavy meal, it can overestimate the stiffness. There's some operator you know, dependency. They, the, the tech has to do this uh, in the right way. And what happens is that you get this score called a KPA score. And depending on the etiology of the liver disease, whether it's hepatitis C, hepatitis B, co-infection, uh, that score correlates with different degrees of fibrosis. So when you get your report, you'll probably see something called a CAP score, and that correlates with the degree of steatosis, and you'll get a second score that says KPA equals, and if you see those higher scores, you know, uh, 13, 14, that usually, and, and the report will, will, will specify this to you that usually is consistent uh, with a diagnosis of cirrhosis. So sometimes you see those scores very high um, and, and you know that that, that correlates with uh, stage four disease. Great. Uh, I wanna, in the interest of time, I wanna be efficient with how we move forward. So Scott, um, can you touch on what gaps we've seen um, in linkage to care? Uh, now that we have shown that treatment can be initiated by frontline providers, our last learning objective is to address barriers to access to treatment, such as stigma and healthcare provider perceptions about substance use and people who inject drugs. What are the gaps, Scott, in terms of linkage to care and continuum of care in PWIDs and how has this changed over the years? I think I'm gonna go through the slide very quickly because I think what Tony's gonna talk about in the next two slides is actually very critical. And just from this slide, you can see that you know, the, the graphs uh, diminished dr dramatically in, you know, people with uh, injection drug use from HCV RNA positive and then getting initiated in care and then treated. And especially in the, the people that are in the younger cohort of less than 35, and you can see the people that go from HCV positive to actually being treated is just essentially a quarter and just an, uh, a, a twelfth uh, who should be there. But Tony has a co-located clinic, and I think the next two slides in, a, in sense of time are just critical to the discussion. Great. So Tony, I'd like you to take us through the next three slides, why it's important to treat HCV infections in PWID populations, what about reinfection, and what data will we have from the simplified trial? Yeah, so simply put, why treat hep C uh, in, in PWID? Because these are the people who have it. These are the people who spread it. Uh, you rob banks because that's where the money is. These are the people who promote infection, the new infections, who are disproportionately affected by chronic infection. So it's essential that we break treatment into this group and you know we can utilize safe syringe programs, harm reduction programs, uh, opiate substitution programs. This is where we really need to either co-localize or use some novel modalities to get treatment into uh, so that we can really engage in, the, in the, the epidemic's base. You know, we worry that the discussion of reinfection comes up a lot. And it's unfortunate that it, it, it comes up among 
people with hep C. And in part, it's because of how you get it. We don't talk about, you know, how many times you retreat someone for cancer, cancer recurrence. If you have breast cancer, we treat you as many times as you need. Uh, if you have CHF, we readmit you anytime you need to. There's no discussion among uh, providers about, well, what if you get CHF again? What if you get cancer again? But for some reason, this narrative has persisted among people who inject drugs. And it's in part based on how they acquired the disease. But when we look at the data, uh, and, and this was a recent meta-analysis, and the rate of reinfection was about 5.9 per 100 person years. Now, if you maintain a patient's opiate substitution therapy or patients who are on opiate agonist therapy, the rate of reinfection was only 3.8 per 100 years. Historically, when we look at the data that's in the literature, it hovers around 2.4 per 100. I can tell you in our clinic, it's exceedingly low, uh, somewhere around 2.4 per 100 person years. Recent study that came out of Canada at ASLD Patients who were maintained on opiate substitution therapy, it was a large cohort uh, of a couple thousand patients. There were no cases of reinfection. So one, I would argue that this narrative should come off the table. Uh, but two, if we're going to hang on to it, understand the data that it's exceedingly low. And if you do this the right way with the right harm reduction, you can lower it even further. Now we have good data about supporting people who inject drugs. This is the Simplify trial. So these were 103 patients who had a history of recent injection drug use, uh, almost a quarter of whom were using at least daily. Uh, the rest had used within the past month. So these were active users. They were treated for 12 weeks with soft vel uh, and the SVR rate was 94%. So this is almost equivalent to the clinical trials. This is equivalent to real world data. And 96% of the patients had greater than 90% adherence. So in this small cohort, um, you can see that the cure rates were very high despite ongoing drug use and recent drug use, and the adherence rates were very high. Now, we've also looked at uh, using GP. On the next slide, uh, we have some data utilizing that regimen, the eight-week regimen. And this looked back retrospectively uh, at the data from the phase two and three clinical trials. And you can see here whether patients were uh, receiving opiate substitution therapy or if they, were, if they were not, there was no difference in the SVR rate. Uh, there's no statistically significant difference here. So they still were just as likely to get cured. Um, and interestingly here, loss to follow-up was reduced when treatment was co-localized in the same medical institution. That's great. I think uh, you really clarified this issue for us. Um, Tony, there are clinical models that are different, um, that are emerging, that may improve linkage to care and retention in care in the PWID population. Can you take us through, through those quickly? Yeah. So really, we have three general modalities that we can utilize. There's the conventional referral system. We identify you in your home clinic. We refer you to a specialist. That's tough. A lot of times those patients don't make that appointment. The system is very difficult to navigate, to call and schedule the appointment. Now we can utilize peer navigators or case managers to help facilitate that, but you really need a multidisciplinary team-based approach. Telemedicine has been utilized in rural settings and in the prison setting. More recently with the COVID crisis, we've implemented this in our clinics. Uh, in the past few months, we've done about 1200 telemedicine visits. It's great in that it immediately overcomes transportation barriers, which is usually the number one factor for why patients don't come to their appointment. Uh, one thing that telemedicine does, however, is that it slows down the cascade from treatment identification to treatment initiation. And that's something that we've learned in the past four months. When you don't have a co-localized program, there's some lag in the patients being able to go somewhere to get the lab work, the lab work then making it back to us so that we can initiate treatment. Finally, the co-localization that we've mentioned, and this is similar to my clinic that we have here in Buffalo, this is really one-stop shopping. This is where the patients come to your facility and in one fell swoop, they're managed for both their hepatitis C and their addiction disorder at the same visit, at the same time, and everything ha happens simultaneously. Yeah, so I think what we can see on the next slide is that mix and match approaches may be effective using a variety of different types of settings and services, uh, different types of providers. We have way more resources than we think, 
and we have to design and tailor this based on what's effective in our community and our patient population. That brings us to this hybrid model of HCV care. Uh, Tony, you presented some really exciting data with this hybrid model of care that you adopted at La Bodega in Buffalo. Um, can you tell us about that in the next couple of slides and the yeah, results we've sure. seen? So like I said, this is a co-localized model. We call it La Bodega because the clinic is a hospital-based clinic with a metal gate. It resembles a New York City bodega. Um, and we have, a, we have a team that is an outreach team led by our world-class social worker, Angela. Uh, she partners with some of the addiction facilities in our area. And she rotates through those sites uh, and, and helps. We've trained those sites how to screen for hep C, what to do. Uh, what labs we need. And when she goes on site, she meets the patients. She actually brings the data back and helps to schedule the patients. We try to see them within a week, um, but we do all the navigating of the linkage. So the patients don't have to call. No one has to fax anything. The appointments are made, then we hand deliver them. Once we, once we make the uh, uh, appointment for the patient, we then uh, are able to facilitate the linkage uh, by staying in constant contact with the patients. So we can arrange for transportation if need be. More recently, we've been utilizing telemedicine. And then once a patient is seen, like I said, everything happens together. Uh, so we initiate opiate substitution treatment with buprenorphine if need be. Uh, but the, that happens in conjunction with immediate treatment for their hepatitis C. And on the next slide, you can see some of our results. In this hybrid model, we look back at almost 300 patients who were actively using. And at the time of the study, uh, 165 of them completed treatment with an SBR rate of 98.8%. There were still 82 patients on treatment, 45 didn't complete. Uh, but we've actually got those 82 who have uh, now finished. Uh, so we've got over 200 patients that completed treatment out of the initial cohort who were very heavy active users with almost a 99% SVR rate. Well, that's really amazing. So um, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, Scott and Tony, I think uh, today's discussion was incredibly useful and uncovered some areas where we may need to make some changes. Uh, let me summarize uh, some key action steps that uh, we would like our audience to come away with. Uh, align screening protocols to updated guidance to ensure that all adults are screened for HCV and linked to care. Uh, PCPs or non-specialist providers can and should be able to recognize and stage uh, liver disease, refer patients who have advanced fibrosis or decompensated cirrhosis or comorbidity or possibly co-infection, although even that is being managed in the primary care setting and then feel empowered and confident to treat patients in the primary care setting, because that is where the patients want to be seen. I can tell you that uh, we've lost many patients who don't want to come to the ivory tower, who can't navigate the parking structure, uh, can't pay for parking, and that's an opportunity to cure a patient that we've lost. And most importantly, substance use does not rule out treatment uh, and adherence and cure rates, as we've seen very compellingly here today, um, are effective um, and, um, uh, and, and very high, even in patients uh, who inject drugs. So um, I want to give the um, audience now a chance to ask our panel of experts any questions or challenging cases. Uh, there are a ton of great questions. Uh, we have a limited amount of time, so it's going to be like lightning round. I'm going to ask each of you to respond with like a one minute or 30 second answer. Uh, Address treatment of HCV in prisons. Tony. Huge problem. Uh, we still, that, that's another big frontier that we need to uh, engage in. It starts with universal screening in, in the entire prison system, in the uh, correctional system, uh, mm -hmm. and we need some standardized guidelines. But uh, absolutely, that's a, a, a huge cohort that in order to eradicate, we need to engage. There are two questions here that I'd like Scott to answer quickly because uh, they're very important. One person pointed out that the reason they were concerned about treating people with injection drug use is not so much adherence, but uh, insurance paying for the medication. And the second was now that HCV screening uh, is recommended by the CDC um, and a USPSTF, 
uh, does Medicare cover it uh, for all individuals, not just boomers? Scott, can you handle that? Um, I can handle most of that. Uh, insurances, uh, you know, whether it's uh, commercial insurance, Medicare or Medicaid, it all depends on the, the line of business um, of what the, the patient's uh, insurance has. And, uh, you know, I have not had any uh, issues regarding uh, prescribing um, within my, uh, within my uh, area, but it all depends on who the patient has as the insurer and what line of business that they have, and it's all going to be different. Um, so just leave it at, uh, at that. So, um, Tony, uh, the question is, if Fib4 is indeterminate and FibroScan is not available, what is the second non-invasive test that you would recommend? Uh, you can use a simple, simple blood test if you wanted to. You can use uh, something called a FibroSure. This is available through all the commercial labs. Uh, measures six parameters. Um, it goes through an algorithm, and it gives you back a score, and that score correlates with the degree of fibrosis. So I would, you know, I would try to combine it with that. If, you've got a, if you're using an APRI or a FIB4 and you can't get the FibroScan, uh, look into getting the FibroSure. Or it's, sometimes it's called a, a fibro test. I think depending on the lab, it has different names. Yeah. Uh, so, Scott, this is an interesting question. What do you do for a patient that has an HCV antibody that's positive, but PCR at 100 copies uh, for many years? Um, uh, well, how would you manage that patient? I'm not sure I have the right answer. Um, but uh, what would you do? Is that somebody you would consider a liver biopsy or look at the liver enzymes? Uh, that's the patient that I, would, that I would refer to you. Ah, good answer. <laughs> um, there's a question here about alpha fetoprotein uh, and several other questions about HCC surveillance. Tony, can you just uh, very briefly summarize um, the recommendations about HCC surveillance and whether alpha fetoprotein is sufficient for surveillance? Alpha fetoprotein is not sufficient on its own for surveillance. Any patient who is, this is simple. If you are stage F3 or F4, get an ultrasound every six months. That's it. That's all you got to do. That, that's your surveillance uh, protocol. Every six months, patient gets an ultrasound. You'll never go wrong. Scott, um, has COVID-19 uh, affected uh, DAA therapy or the, the environment for treating HCV in, in your practice? And how would you recommend uh, PCPs uh, address it in the setting of COVID? I think with COVID right now, we've switched to 100% telemedicine. I haven't seen a, an active live patient in going on three months right now. Everything's been telemedicine. So exactly what Tony said before is that there's a kind of delay into the initiation and start because we need laboratory values. We need all that, you know, to properly stage the patient. The, the one thing that I can say about telemedicine is that, you know, I used to have a, a large panel that wouldn't show up every day. But now, you know, I get like 90% hits with all of my patients on telemedicine. And so my follow-up patients are, are done, you know, quite well, but my initiation has been delayed, you know, over these last three months of getting the ancillary labs and everything. Another question, Scott, is um, do you treat all patients, even F1, F2? Maybe you can really drive this point home about the importance of elimination and treating patients regardless of fibrosis stage. I I, I think primary care physicians, you know, especially with the, the younger adults, um, and when you properly stage them uh, with all the laboratory tests, um, and, you know, sh should be able to identify and you should be able to initiate DAA um, in the primary care setting um, for people that don't have advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis, and especially not decompensated cirrhosis. And not only that, but you also have to look at those comorbidities. You have to look at EGFR. You have to look at, you know, anything else that would be considered, a, you know, an extreme comorbidity. But out of that, you should be able to treat uh, with DAAs uh, in that primary care setting. Chris, I would answer that question just a little bit differently. I would say equivalent hep C with cancer. Even if a patient has just a little bit of cancer, you treat it. 
Even if the patient has just a little bit of diabetes, you treat it. So even if the patient has F0 or F1 fibrosis, they have a chronic infection that can lead to long-term problems, you need to treat it. Tony, totally agree, yes. Um, so uh, with regard to pregnancy, what uh, trimester should you be screening in? And at what age do you start treating the children if you're in a primary care practice? Uh, Tony, I think that might be better set from a specialty you know, perspective. Yeah, I, I mean, I would identify, as far as when to screen them, I would screen them immediately upon confirmation that they're pregnant. Um, when to treat the child, uh, again, it depends on what treatment regimen is being utilized. Uh, but you can get down to, I believe it's down to age three right now, depending on if the child meets certain weight criteria. Um, and, and the genotype matters. So there's some factors around children. Uh, there's some important variables, uh, you know, age, weight, things like that, what genotype they have. Um, so I don't know that I would, you know, I would partner with specialty care. Here in Buffalo, we've partnered with the Division of Family Medicine to treat children uh, who we are now identifying by screening our patients who may have been pregnant uh, with kids. So I would partner up with specialists there, but I would identify the pregnant women as soon as possible. What age do you screen the child? So that's a, that's a tricky uh, bit right there that there's also not a lot of consensus. We've seen kids uh, who are born, then you know they're positive, the immune system changes over, they need to be rechecked. We've had kids who are negative then convert as far out as 18 months. Um, so I believe, I, you know, the, the pediatricians, I sat on an ad board about this and there was some debate about when you check them, but I think the general consensus was at birth, at one year, um, and then I believe at 18 months, but I, I'm speaking a little bit out of turn as I am not a pediatrician. And then for uh, Scott, um, screen everyone over 18 years of age at least once, correct? Yes. Great. Um, so thank you, Scott and Tony. This has been a great discussion. Uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't get to all the questions. It just shows that we need to do this again. Uh, but the engagement of the audience has been fantastic. Um, the uh, questions are awesome and hopefully most of you got them answered. I really wanna thank uh, Scott and Tony for giving that experienced and knowledgeable uh, lecture and interaction today. Thank you for joining us. We hope you'll be able to use these strategies to screen, stage, and initiate treatment in your patients with HCV. Have a good evening and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.